All right, y'all. Welcome back. And uh, in this lecture, we are going to cover um, early hominin origins. Um, essentially, we're going to talk about some um, essentially paranthropuses and australopithecines um, that pretty much led up to the development of the genus Homo, which is where our species comes from. Uh, remember last time, uh, you know, before we kind of went on our uh, virus lockdown here, um, we had uh, talked about early primate evolution. And remember at the end of the Miocene, uh, there was that climatic shift and a lot of those ape species either went into extinct or migrated back into Africa. And it's um, out of those species or out of some of those species where these kind of early hominins um, develop. And we're going to talk about from the very earliest um, all the way up through um, the latest. And um, essentially, we look at the early hominins and we view them as important because this is the uh, essentially the period of time in which we begin to shift from being a creature that uh, walks around on all fours um, up to a creature that walks around on um, two legs or what we call bipedality. So as you uh, move through the rest of the lectures here, um, a kind of conflict um, that uh, we address in physical anthropology, and it, it, it kind of exists in biology in general, um, is this notion of a lumping versus splitting in taxonomy. Um, remember when we talked about cladistic analysis, you know, or, or, or uh, taxonomy in general, where you're trying to lump um, creatures based on similar features? Well, in essence, a lumper is someone who tries to create broad categories based on similarities, whereas a splitter tries to create new categories for each unique trait. Um, and this plays an important role when we look at the human fossil record and some of our uh, ancient relatives, um, primarily because uh, sometimes you'll see in the literature um, new species of homos found um, out there, uh, sometimes the last one uh, was Homo luzonensis found in Southeast Asia. Before that was uh, one called Homo naledi, um, which we'll take a look at. Um, and the issue with this is, is, well, are they really distinct new species, or are they just um, different variations of species that already exist, right? Because remember, within any given species, there's going to be a wide range of variation. And remember when we talked about fossilization, hopefully you've listened to that recorded lecture, um, fossilization itself is very rare, right? So we're only seeing the most common of those phenotypes, right? So how do we really know if this is an actual new species or if this is just uh, part of that range of variation for one of the species that we have already discovered? So if we use Homo naledi as an example here, um, there's a debate that goes on between John Hawks versus Tim White. Um, John Hawks, who worked on Homo naledi, uh, found in South Africa, uh, says that Homo naledi is a new distinct uh, species, right? But Tim White will assert that it's just a primitive Homo erectus specimen. So it really defines, you know, these are two experts in the field, and it really depends on what your threshold of difference is. Um, Tim White would say that there's just not enough difference between Homo naledi and these other Homo erectuses um, to really say that it's a distinct species. It may just be slightly more primitive. Um, John Hawks, on the other hand, would say, well, Homo naledi is not the same, or, you know, and there's just a lot of difference between Homo naledi and the Homo erectus specimen, so it should be classified as its own new distinct species. So the Homo naledi specimens were found in South Africa in the D. naledi and naledi chambers. Um, <clears throat> both found are in the, within this kind of cave, cave system that's over one and a half miles long. They're morphologically similar to other Homo erectus specimens at about an 89% similarity. So right, if we go back to our debate on lumping versus splitting, is something being 11% different? enough to say that it's a new species, right? Or is it, you know, because it's 89% similar to Homo erectus, should we really just call it another Homo erectus? It was found in the uh, 
rising star cave system in South Africa. You can see it marked on the uh, map to the right here in 2013. So in terms of the um, kind of comparison here between uh, Homo naledi and uh, a Homo erectus specimen, which is all the way on the right here, um, you can see there's a little bit of a difference. Um, this particular specimen here, the brain case, is a little bit smaller than we see on our um, Homo erectus. Um, the draw structure is a little more primitive than we see on the Homo erectus. Um, but as you can see, in terms of morphology or general morphology, it's relatively um, the same. The differences are just minor. Um, essentially, what, what we can see here is, well, this has a smaller brain case, this has a slightly larger brain case, and this has a slightly larger brain case, right? These all correspond to um, basically steps in time and morphological change. And as that brain case increases, that's when you see changes in these jaw structures. So really, this could just be, this uh, Homo naledi here could just be a, um, a basically a more primitive uh, Homo erectus. There has been argument that the Homo uh, naledi specimen, otherwise known as Neo, um, is just another Australopithecine, but as we can see based on the specimens being laid out side to side, um, there are some distinct differences between the two. Um, the Homo naledi specimen or Neo on the right there is distinctly larger um, than our little Lucy on the left. Um, there's even some differences in how the rib cage is oriented and a little difference in terms of how the um, uh, femur is oriented too. Um, you should kind of take notice of the angle at which Lucy's femur comes down and the more kind of exaggerated angle at which Neo's uh, femur comes down, right? So what this is saying is that this creature here is far more of a um, biped than uh, our little Lucy here, right? So it's definitely not an Australopithecine in terms of its morph morphology, right? It's actually a lot more, um, uh, it's bipedal locomotion, um, is much more evolved at this point. So when we look at kind of this lumping versus splitting debate, it's really looking at kind of these specimens side by side and really determining um, how much actual difference and um, whether or not that difference really constitutes um, the justification for creating a whole new species name, right? Um, so if we look at some of the members of the genus Homo here, uh, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, and Homo naledi, um, there's been significant argument uh, that uh, Homo floresiensis as well as Homo naledi are simply um, just Homo erectuses, right? Um, we're going to look at Homo floresiensis um, a little bit later on in both lecture and you guys will look at it in your lab activities as well. Um, and you're going to see that, you know, based on some of the evidence that we found with Homo floresiensis, um, it's clear that that is not a, a new distinct species, that it's uh, morphologically similar to Homo erectus as well as some of the technological materials that it was found with um, are. Uh, you know, contemporaneous with Homo erectus. So in a general sense, um, when we look at the hominid timeline, this is what you're going to see starting all the way back with our C. helanthropus chadensis um, going all the way up to our Homo sapiens, right? Um, and for kind of our intensive purposes here, um, we kind of lump these uh, into kind of some different categories here, right? So we have what we call the um, kind of Artipithecus group, um, you know, very ape-like, right? I'm going to try and write this here, but it's going to uh, not come out very good. Uh, very ape-like, um, very, very uh, kind of primitive features, just starting the kind of uh, evolutionary steps to becoming bipedal. And then we have our Australopithecine group here, right? And it's a pretty big um, group. 
And there's a whole lot of variation there. We're going to see two distinct areas in which these australopithecines pop up, right? There's going to be um, our australopithecines in East Africa as well as our australopithecines in uh, South Africa. Um, and we're going to talk about each uh, individual species, and each uh, you know species has kind of these distinct features, but they all have um, some common morphology. And then we're going to kind of move on to talking about the uh, genus Homo, right, which is our Homo group. Um, and the issue with this is that there are a lot of different variations. We have Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo sapiens. Um, for all intensive purposes, we're not really going to talk a whole lot about Homo ergaster. We're not going to talk a whole lot about Homo rudolfensis, right? The ones we're really going to focus on are the ones that we have the most specimens for and the ones that have kind of contributed the most to our, our kind of special evolutionary change, right? We're going to talk about Homo habilis, uh, moving into Homo erectus, moving into Homo neanderthalensis, and then finally concluding with um, Homo sapiens. So in essence, when we go to look in the fossil record for ancient human ancestors, or when we find a potential candidate for what we might consider an ancient human ancestor, there's some several things we're kind of looking for. Um, we're looking for anatomical traits and behaviors, which can be inferred from those traits, right? So we look for characteristics that are kind of shared by modern humans and their direct ancestors, right? Our, our kind of homo, all the way back to homo erectus, but not shared by other apes, right, or other fossil apes. One of the uh, primary regions we're going to talk about is this kind of middle Awash region in Ethiopia, as well as the Gona region. Um, this is extremely important um, in terms of our early hominid evolution, right? Most morphological and evolutionary change um, occurs in species that have kind of existed in these areas over um, several million years. So in essence, we can go far as far back um, theoretically as uh, 10 million years ago um, to about 5.3 million years ago. Uh, we look at this as in the uh, otherwise known as the Great Rift Valley in Eastern Africa. And well, why do we have the development of hominids in this area? Well, there's a couple different theories. Um, that exist, and we'll look at a few of them. So how do we define what is a hominin? Well, our early hominins have two primary characteristics. They have um, morphological characteristics that indicate bipedal locomotion. They have non-honing uh, chewing, which essentially means they have very small canines and no or a very, very small diastema. Essentially, what we're looking at is a reduction in these canine teeth over time, right? These two traits preceded things like material culture and language by several million years, right? So these are the first two things that we look for in terms of kind of the first steps towards what it is to um, becoming uh, human. So based on the evidence that we have so far um, with our hominins, uh, our artipithecuses, as well as our afferentheses and some of our other australopithecines, um, we do have male and female specimens of most of them. Um, and we notice that in terms of the sexual dimorphism between males and females, there's relatively little. There's only a slight difference in body height between males and females, right? So what does a lack of sexual dimorphism indicate about a species behavioral patterns based on what we learned about other primates, right? It means that mates were acquired via cooperation rather than uh, vicious competition, right? So we know that a lack of sexual dimorphism uh, means that there are two distinct patterns within that species, right? That males are cooperating to acquire mates rather than competing, and there's probably a higher degree of male um, parental investment in terms of rearing young. In terms of uh, the development of bipedality or bipedalism or otherwise locomotion on two feet, right, which is how humans themselves locomote or move around, right, it involved a whole host of changes to our morphology or the morphology of these early hominins, right? The foramen magnum over time of the skull becomes situated over the pelvis, right? We have spinal lordosis, which places the center of gravity directly over the pelvis, and spinal lordosis is just a fancy way for saying our spine curves in several places, right? And the one that's most important is your lumbar lordosis, right? That's the one that kind of centers 
uh, your entire spinal column over your pelvis, right? The entire goal of all of these changes was to center our gravity directly over our pelvis, right? Because that's the only way that bipedal locomotion uh, mechanically is possible, right? In terms of the pelvis, we have a shortened ilium, right, uh, which makes it more conducive for upright posture. We have longer legs relative to arms. We have a valgus knee, uh, which essentially means that our knees come together in the, uh, you know, as our femurs kind of come down at a uh, degree. We have a bicondylar angle. Uh, which is greater than 90 degrees. Uh, the longitudinal arch on the bottom of the foot, right? We actually have an arch in the middle of our foot. And we have no opposable big toe, right? These are kind of the, all of the hallmark features of bipedality, right? And we're going to see as we move through our Artipithecus class and into our Australopithecines that the changes that in all of these different areas, the pelvis, the spine, the uh, scalp, the knees, the ankles, all of those changes occurred at different times and at different rates, right? So we're going to see creatures with a whole host of kind of mismatch of features, some of them more primitive, um, closer to uh, quadrupedal locomotion, and some of them more uh, closer to um, upright bipedal locomotion. So if you look at just one example here, and we'll get into these in uh, much more detail as we move on through the lecture. Um, we have our Australopithecus afarensis here on the uh, left, our little Lucy. And we have our Homo erectus on the um, right, right? And our Homo erectus was really our kind of first runner, two-legged two, uh, two runner. Um, the Australopithecus afarensis was um, essentially still very good at moving around in the trees, but um, was when it was on the ground, was walking on two legs. And you can see there's some distinct changes um, or distinct differences uh, between the two skeletal structures, right? You can see the stabilized kind of foot arch in our Homo erectus as opposed to our Australopithecine afarensis, right, which has relatively fat, flat feet. Um, you can see that the finger bones, as well as the arms in our Australopithecus afarensis, are much longer than they are in our Homo erectus, right? And the legs themselves are a little bit shorter in our afarensis than our Homo erectus, right? That, those are kind of primitive features that are uh, more conducive for climbing around in the trees, right? Essentially, our Homo erectus is a creature that is fully on the ground, no longer really climbing in the trees too much and exclusively moving around on two legs. So if we look at the kind of skull in terms of trying to orient uh, whether or not a creature is bipedal, right, your foramen magnum or the very large hole in the bottom of the skull is used to infer locomotion type, right? In arboreal primates, the foramen magnum is positioned towards the back of the base of the skull, right? And in a lot of um, quadrupedal creatures in general, the foramen magnum is situated on the back of the skull rather than the bottom, right? In terrestrial quadrupeds, the foramen magnum is positioned on the uh, back, uh, actual back of the skull, right? Um, whereas if you're looking at an arboreal primate, it's kind of on the back towards the, uh, on the bottom towards the back. In bipedal hominins, on the other hand, the foramen magnum is positioned on the central inferior section of the skull. So it's basically smack dab in the uh, middle of the skull. So as we move through kind of our evolutionary lineage, what we're going to see in terms of the skull is a shift in this frame and magnum position over time, right? Going back, um, you know, if we look at the creature that was probably very close to a chimpanzee when we diverged from their lineage between uh, seven to nine million years ago, um, the frame and magnum is probably very, very close to that of a chimpanzee, right? Still kind of an arboreal uh, quadruped. If we look at our Australopithecus um, afarensis here, you can see that the foramen magnum is shifted there, right? It's a little more close to the um, center of the skull, right? So that's a little bit further on in time with our Lucy's um, existing around three to four million years ago. Um, and then, of course, we look at our uh, modern human here, right? The foramen magnum, of course, is in the bottom center of the skull, right? So you can kind of see this as a, a shift over time, right? 
So um, in essence, what you're seeing is kind of the evolutionary change in the skull. And it didn't occur all at once, right? That, that's what I'm trying to get across here is this, these changes that occurred in our lineage um, took millions upon millions of years to occur, right? The kind of beginning of bipedalism started around 7 million years ago, and it took up to, um, you know, about four or up to, excuse me, about three million years ago for the process to really be only about 90% complete, right? So these large scale evolutionary changes take millions upon millions of years and many generations to occur. So if we look at the pelvis, the changes that occurred in the pelvis over time, the ilium becomes uh, much shortened. The iliac blades on the side are more laterally oriented. The pubic symphysis uh, is shortened as well. The pelvic outlet um, is narrowed, and that's actually going to be um, a deleterious side effect that we'll talk about. And the sacrum itself um, is widened. So if we look at our human versus chimp pelvis, right, we can see with the chimp pelvis, the iliac blades here are facing the front, right? You know, they're front to back. And our human, the iliac blades are side to side, right? So this is a bipedal creature as opposed to a quadruped. If we look at the sacrum and the chimpanzee, it's very um, narrow, right? If we look at the sacrum on the human, it's much wider, right? Um, if we look at the spinal column itself, is, is a lot wider on a human. And I understand, yes, a human is a little bit larger of a creature, but in terms of uh, locomotion ability, you know, it's really the shape of these pelvises that indicate um, what the locomotion will be, right? So the iliums are longer in our chimpanzee than they are in our human, right? And as well as the pubic symphysis, right? It's much, 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 much longer, um, taller than in our human, right? So, um, you know, there's distinct changes that have occurred over time that have led to the kind of human pelvis. And this is essentially what we um, started with, right? So if this is what we started with, you know, it takes millions of years to get to um, the human pelvis that we have here. So there are some uh, problems with bipedalism here. Uh, it's not the most efficient mode of locomotion. It doesn't expend a whole lot of energy, but we're not very quick. We can't traverse um, distances very quickly. Upright posture, of course, um, gives you more exposure to predators, especially when you're one of our ancient ancestors and you're only about uh, four and a half, five feet tall, and you don't have any stone tools or weapons really to protect you yet. Uh, we are prone to pulled hamstrings, right? Because of the orientation of our pelvis and the changes, some of those muscle attachment sites in our pelvis are not as robust or not as strong as they used to be. So we're prone to pulling and ripping muscles from those attachment sites. Uh, and there are more pressure on our circulatory system, which causes varicose veins. And we're more prone to infections or malformations in our patellas, right? And those are actually occurring or those will occur and you won't even know they're happening, right? Sometimes your knee will just get swollen and you'll think that you sprained it or you hurt it. Well, what's actually going on is it's an infection in your patella. And we can tell that because if you look at the uh, two images here, we've got on the left a normal patella. That's what your patella is supposed to look like. And on um, the right here, we have a patella out of an adult male um, who lived to be about 60 years old, right? And you can see that that patella has been malformed um, from infection over the years. Another kind of uh, deleterious trade-off that we have in our um, shift to bipedal locomotion is something that we refer to as the obstetric dilemma. Um, if we look at our uh, little chart here, our orangs, our chimps, and our gorillas, right? Their babies' heads, which are the kind of black circles there, have no problem making it through the birth canal, right? Um, humans, on the other hand, because we shifted to bipedal locomotion, we narrowed our pelvis quite a bit. Couple that with a evolutionary trend for increasing brain size over time. And remember, traits don't, you know, our bodies don't morphologically change all at the same time, right? Different traits, your pelvis is changing at a different rate than your skull. Your skull is changing at a different rate than your long bones. Um, so in essence, what ended up happening here is the changes in the pelvis made our pelvis narrow, but the changes in our skull made the skull bigger, right, and the brain larger. So in essence, now we have the situation where babies' heads are perilously close to not being able to fit 
through the birth canal, right? This is kind of why um, there's been a lot of early, uh, you know, why childbirth was kind of an early death or one of the primary causes of death in, um, before the advent of modern medicine, right? Because of this dilemma here. And it's interesting to see if this trend continues, whether or not we will have to switch over to, um, you know, medically induced kind of cesarean sections and things like that in order to birth uh, children. This is showing you the um, bicondylar angle. Normally, if we were in the lab, we would actually have you measure this yourself um, and give us the bicondylar angles of, you know, bipeds versus quadrupeds. Um, I believe in the online lab, we provided you with those angles um, so that you can complete the activity. But I, I still have this in here because I want you to see um, basically how our knees come together in the middle, right? And it shows that kind of basically we have this line of or center of gravity that goes down the very center of our body all the way through to our feet, right? Our entire morphological, our entire skeletal system, our bow plan, our body plan is all oriented to have that line of gravity right in the middle going down um, on our pelvis. So if we look at some of the changes that occur in the feet, primarily what we essentially call this the um, ankle area, we have a shortened calcaneus bone in, um, over time that occurs. If we look at just uh, between the gorilla here, one of our ape relatives versus um, us, you can see their calcaneus is much, much longer. Um, the talus has been oriented more superiorly, right? So that big kind of um, essentially what you call your ankle bone that big ball on the side of your foot, um, that actually has been moved uh, upwards rather than kind of downwards, which is how it is in chimpanzees and some of our other ape relatives. Uh, we have no opposable big toe. We lost the ability to have an opposable big toe as opposed to our gorilla here, right? On the little chart here, it's labeled as the hallux. And we have shortened metatarsal bones, right? Our uh, you know feet digits are not as long as our other ape relatives, right? You can see that our feet are relatively stiff and our toes are relatively um, short. What we also see um, generally over time as we move from our ape to our uh, little artipithecus to our modern humans, right, moving from right to left here on this chart, we can see that um, over time there's an increasing in the amount of enamel that is on the teeth, right? So in essence, um, you know, there are other changes that we'll talk about in the tooth structure, but this is a general pattern that we see moving, uh, you know, on through time is that tooth enamel um, thickness gets um, greater. Uh, once we get to kind of Homo sapiens where it's at its maximum. There are some other differences that we see in kind of the um, teeth of hominins versus our kind of ape relatives. If we look at a comparison here of chimpanzee versus um, our Australopithecus afarensis in the middle and our human jaw in the um, right here is that, well, um, we actually see something kind of interesting that occurs with Australopithecines. Teeth get bigger during the Australopithecine era, um, kind of culminating with some of our, and we'll look at them later, our kind of robust Australopithecines who had very, very large teeth. But as we move into the genus Homo, teeth began to get smaller again. Um, we'll talk about why that is. But in terms of just generalized shape, what we see moving on through time is that we move from having this kind of parallel um, dental arcade, right, in our chimpanzee, we can take these teeth and kind of match them up very parallel. If we look at our um, Australopithecus afarensis, um, it gets a little bit wider, right? And it's, uh, yeah, it's still relatively parallel, right? But if we look at our humans, right, the teeth begin to kind of um, become even more widened out, right? And it's not exactly um, distinctly parallel, right? You just have a little bit of movement there. Um, this is something that we call parallel versus parabolic, right? Humans have a parabolic dental row versus apes, and some of our ancient ancestors have more of a parallel um, dental row. So showing you uh, just basically the same photo, right? You can see on our afarensis, it's still relatively um, parallel, right? 
uh, chimpanzee is still relatively parallel, but the teeth are bigger and morphologically more similar to our humans, right? But as we look at our modern human, you could see that the dental row kind of starts to expand even further um, as it kind of gets back to these, these, these molars, right? So it's not exactly um, directly parallel with each other. So I, um, you know, throw these teeth up here because teeth are a great way for a paleontologist or a physical anthropologist to kind of orient where a species may be, right? Remember, we've always kind of said that teeth are under really tight genetic control. So it takes an awful lot of genetic change in order for teeth to really shift morphologically a whole lot. And as you can see, right, if we look at we have our, our afarensis and our africansis, our africanus. These are both Australopithecine species. And you can see, as you can see, the teeth are a little bit bigger here, right? But morphologically, they're still very similar to all of the rest that we see, right? General Y5 pattern that we see in all of our hominins and our apes. Um, but as you can see, when we get into Homo habilis, Homo naledi, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens, the teeth are basically the same size as each other, right? Some of them are a little bit smaller than others. Some of them are a little bit bigger. Um, but in essence, morphologically, they're pretty much the same, right? So this is why we can kind of see that our genus line gets kind of drawn right here, right? Starting with the genus Homo, right, and our Australopithecines. So kind of the question that you get um, out there is, are apes bipedal? Um, yes, if you kind of peruse YouTube and look at some of the primate literature, you'll see that yes, um, a lot of ape species and even some monkeys, um, like spider monkeys, um, gibbons, uh, chimpanzees, some of these creatures are able of walking on uh, two legs, but they can only do so for very short um, periods of time, right? This is something that uh, has a very specific um, name in terms of um, locomotion, right? So apes really don't have the anatomy to be true bipeds, right? If they're seen walking on two legs, um, this is what we call the bent knee, bent hip gait, right? And as you can see in the photo over here, as they walk on two legs, they sway from side to side, right? The entire upper body sways from side to side because the anatomy itself is not oriented for bipedal locomotion. It's oriented for walking on all fours, right? So based on a center of gravity, which is oriented based on anatomical features, we know that, yes, an ape may be able to walk on two legs, but only for a very, very short period of time. So they're not true bipeds. So if we look at another major difference that we see in hominins versus the other apes, the orientation of the uh, facial muscles is different, right? The temporalis muscle on the side of your head actuates in an up and down motion rather than a back to front motion, which is what we see in a lot of the other apes, right? You're going to see a picture of a gorilla and you're going to see how the temporalis muscle is oriented much differently in the gorilla as opposed to the um, human, which we see here. So if we look at our gorilla here, um, you can see that the temporalis muscle is actually oriented um, front to back rather than up and down. And there's also something or another feature here that I want you to pay attention to. It's something up here called the sagittal crest, right? This is a ridge of bone um, that anchors this temporalis muscle, right? Um, and we're going to notice that as changes in diet occur, um, some of our ancient ancestors have these sagittal crests, right? Some of the older um, Australopithecines and our Artipithecuses have this sagittal crest, but as we move further on in time and get closer to the genus Homo, right, that sagittal crest disappears because of that difference in orientation of the temporalis muscle. So if we look at a few of the theories behind hominin development, and I'm not going to say that any of these are particularly correct, we have Darwin's hunting hypothesis, and he basically says that it was really our drive to hunt which developed uh, bipedality, right? We have Rodman and McHenry's uh, patchy forest hypothesis that we were forced to move on two legs to go from stand of trees to stand of trees. Um, we have Lovejoy's provisioning hypothesis. It's one of the few kind of behavioral hypotheses that we have that uh, Lovejoy said we shifted to bipedal locomotion because it was easier for males to carry things and males who were able to carry things were able to bring food and provisions to females and increase um, friendly rapport, right? And that friendly rapport led to more successful mating. 
Uh, but there are problems with each of these hypotheses or each of these theories. Um, bipedalism, in essence, predates or precedes stone tools and hunting by several million years. Um, bipedal locomotion is pretty energy costly, so it's not that it uh, increased efficiency per se, like Rodman and McHenry say. And unfortunately for Lovejoy's provisioning hypothesis, monogamy as a behavior is very hard to prove. So we can't really say that males were really, you know, behavioral inferences can only go so far in the fossil record. So we can say that we think that males may have been provisioning females, but, you know, Lovejoy's model is based on a um, idea that these ancient hominids practice monogamy. And we even know with humans today that monogamy is not a primary marriage system throughout most of the world. So it's kind of hard to really say that that those ancient hominins um, would have been strictly monogamous with one another. So let's start taking a look at our ancient fossil record here. Um, we look at our pre-Australopithecines kind of lumped in with our Artipithecuses. Um, we have our Sihalanthropus chadensis, um, earliest at seven to six million years ago, found in the uh, central African country of Chad. The brain case size was around 350 cc's, had a massive brow ridge, right? What we mean by brow ridge is this kind of feature that we see right here. Um, the kind of anatomical name for it is the superorbital um, torus. Uh, bipedalism likely based on the uh, foramen magnum position, at least according to the researchers that um, uh, reconstructed the skull. It had non-honing canines, right? So we know that it's definitely a hominin. And uh, it had both ape and human features, right? So the, the finger bones that we found were very elongated, much like an ape, but a lot of the skull features that we see are very similar to um, kind of Artipithecuses and Australopithecines. So if we look at another uh, pre-Australopithecine group, um, we have our Artipithecuses, right? And actually some of our uh, researchers or some physical anthropologists will lump these guys in with Australopithecines, and others will actually make an argument that they are not um, part of the human lineage at all. Um, but we have two distinct species, right, popping up around 4 million years ago. Uh, we have Artipithecus ramidus, which is one we kind of lovingly call Artie. Um, and then we have another species called Artipithecus cadaba, right? They're found in the Afar Depression in Ethiopia. Definitely forest dwellers based on their anatomy, right? They have very, very long finger bones. Um, they have very, very uh, kind of um, uh, long arm bones. Um, all of this indicative of arboreal movement, but they have skull and pelvis features that um, make them a little bit more like an australopithecine, right? A little bit more like a part-time um, biped. They had thinner enamel than later human fossils, right? So essentially they're a good candidate of being an in-between step from that creature that uh, broke away from the chimpanzee lineage and um, later developed into kind of our, our Cihalanthropuses and so forth. Um, it had a very primitive mastication complex, but still the canines were very um, reduced on this, right? So in essence, what we're seeing here is, uh, yes, it had some of the, it had a sagittal crest, right? It had some of the kind of primitive features that we see in other apes and other fossil apes, but it had reduced canines, right? So, which is much more similar to what we see in our Australopithecines as well as our, um, the genus Homo. It had an opposable big toe, uh, but a stiff foot arch, right? So we're seeing, even in the uh, foot morphology, we're seeing a mosaic of features, right? We're seeing a human-like or kind of a um, biped-like feature of a stiff foot arch, but we're still seeing a more ape-like feature of a opposable big toe, right? So in essence, our Artie was our very, very beginning of uh, kind of bipedalism. So in essence, he was a part-time quadruped. Um, actually, I would have to say it's probably more of an 80-20 split where he spent 80% of his time in the trees and 20% of his time on the ground walking on um, two legs. Jumping a little bit back in time, we have another kind of pre-Australopithecine specimen generally lumped in with our Artipithecus group called Aurora Tugenensis, right, which originally means original man, but we know it's not the original man. Um, it's, it was found in the Great Rift 
um, valley area, right? Had elongated finger bones like an ape, had non-honing teeth, much more like an australopithecine or human or homo, um, had an elongated femoral neck, much like that of a um, a uh, genus homo as well. Um, and what was kind of more important about it is that what we look for is kind of this bony buildup that occurs on the top of the femur here, right? So we see kind of a, a, a more of a density here in terms of bone um, that we don't see in chimpanzees or kind of quadrupedal creatures, right? So when we see that density of bone, we know that there's been significant forces kind of placed on top of this actual bone, which causes that density to increase based off of Wolf's Law. So our most recent kind of taxonomy that you'll see most commonly out in the literature today is that we have several genera that come before Australopithecines, right? We have the Aurorans, we have the Ceolanthropuses, and we have the Artipithecines, right? Then we have many more species of Australopithecines. We have Anamensis, we have Afarensis, we have this specimen called Platyops, and we also have a whole bunch of robust Australopithecines Pithocines that we'll talk about. And we have several more species of Homo, right? So in essence, what we're seeing here is kind of our movement through time, right? Starting with the kind of oldest here, right? And uh, moving to our kind of most recent in time, right? So our Australopithecines um, as a genus are not quite apes, right? Because they don't share really a whole lot of fa features with the apes, but they're not quite humans, right? They're not, they can't be classified as in the genus Homo because they are different enough from um, all of the other members. It's a, considered a subfamily of the family Hominidae. They are hominins because they walked upright, but were not human or not part of the genus Homo because they had relatively small brains, right? Barely larger than the size of a chimpanzee. Some of the Australopithecines are proposed to be ancestors to humans, and some of those Australopithecines became extinct and left no descendants, right? We're just not really 100% sure um, really which ones led to um, our kind of lineage or the genus Homo, right? We have a lot of um, kind of good inferences that we can make and some good educated guesses, but really there's no evidence that's definitive that can say, well, this Australopithecine led to the genus Homo. We're just not, um, you know, the fossil record here is just a little too gray. So our first Australopithecines were found in the 1920s in South Africa by a gentleman named uh, Raymond Dart. And they were uh, originally called the kind of first missing links, right? So various skulls were found first. These kind of looked ape-like, but with slightly uh, bigger brains and smaller front teeth than much of the apes that they saw at the time, right? So it created kind of much controversy. Then later, the pelvis and lower, bin, uh, lower limb bones were found, and these, we knew, looked distinctly bipedal, right? So we knew that these creatures were bipedal and had slightly larger brains than um, some of the modern apes. So here we can see um, Raymond Dart with uh, what we call the Tong Child, right, which is his first um, discovery of Australopithecus afarensis, right, or excuse me, Africanus, uh, which translates roughly into the southern ape. Um, he thought it was the skull of a baby monkey, but further testing yielded an altogether new uh, species, right? So in essence, what he was really doing was he um, – found, well, you know, what was so fundamental about this find was that he found a juvenile, right? We're actually going to see pictures of uh, the Tong child here in a minute. So not only did he find a new species, but he also found a juvenile um, specimen, right? So he became kind of a pioneer in um, not only kind of physical anthropology, but also the study of different stages in life history for some of these early specimens, right? And he was one of the proponents of the kind of killer ape man hypothesis, which um, has since been discredited. That's why I don't even bring it up in terms of our possible pot hypotheses for um, the development of hominins, right? Um, but we can see on the uh, on the left here is our, our Raymond Dart, and um, on the right here is our um, Lewis Leakey. We'll talk about Lewis Leakey a little bit uh, later here. 
So our Australopithecus africanus, right, our first kind of Australopithecine found and otherwise known as the Tong child, was a juvenile specimen about three to four uh, years in age. Um, and we know the foramen magnum position uh, infers uh, bipedalism, had small canine teeth without a diastema, had a parabolic shaped jaw, so it was more human than ape-like, had a kind of a small brain, but definitely larger than that of a modern chimpanzee, and a hip girdle that was more human-like than ape-like, right? So what we're seeing here is kind of a biped, but had still some ape-like features. Well, you can even see that there's some facial prognathism here, which is a fancy term for how far does the um, face stick away from the rest of the skull, right? And that's more of a primitive feature. But our um, Tong child dates to around 3 to 2.3 um, million years ago, right? So it's definitely kind of um, not as old as our Artipithecuses or our Rorins or our C. Helanthropuses, right? Um, so it's definitely um, kind of moving some of these traits in the right direction towards the development of the genus Homo. So a lot of the early kind of physical anthropologists thought that really our drive to become bipedal was to get on two legs so that we can carry weapons in battle um, creatures and each other. Um, this has long since been discredited, so it, it's kind of interesting um, some of the various theories that pop up. So it's um, you know a little bit like this image here from uh, 2001 of Space Odyssey, or this image here that comes directly out of a uh, National Geographic magazine. One of the more colorful hypotheses to the development of hominins, bipedality, and stone tools is something that they call the mushroom ape hypothesis, that it was the stimulation of DMT uh, from eating these uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms that really spurred the development of brain growth. Um, unfortunately, this is kind of a weird fringe uh, hypothesis that doesn't really have much um, actual factual base um, really supporting it. But if you look it up on Google, you will find this uh, out there. So it's kind of interesting. So apart from our Africanuses that are found in South Africa, we also find a lot of other Australopithecine fossils in the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia, right? And these have been dated using um, standard radiometric um, methods, right? Like uh, carbon and potassium argon dating. So what we're going to start to see over time here, um, as we look at these various species in the uh, genus Australopithecine, as well as the genus Artipithecus and the genus Homo, um, is that we're going to see um, changes that occur at different parts of the body at different times, right? This is something that we call mosaic evolution, right? It's a pattern of evolution in which the rate of evolution in one functional system varies from the rate of that of other systems, right? So all it's really saying is that, you know, uh, your dental system, your locomotor system, and your neurological system, particularly your brain, all evolved at different rates, right? So your brain growth happened at a different speed and at a different time than your evolution of bipedality, right? So all these changes aren't occurring, um, you know, as one large big package, right? They're all occurring at different times and at different rates with one another. As our kind of example of um, our kind of differences in terms of mosaic evolution, right? If we look at uh, our brain size chart here, we have our pan troglodytes, that's our modern chimp at 395, right? That's kind of our base comparison. Um, but as you can see, as we move further on in time here, um, we start to get um, fluctuations here, right? Our Australopithecus africanus, who is much earlier uh, than our Paranthropus aethiopicus, right, um, is kind of, and, and much earlier than our Paranthropus boisei and robustus, right, has relatively the same brain size as our boisei and robustus, but has a much larger brain than a aethiopicus, right, and a much larger brain than afarensis, right. So in essence, what I, this is really kind of demonstrating is that there's a fluctuation or there's, you know, different rates at which different species have evolved their um, brain sizes. So mosaic evolution is important as a concept because it really kind of defines or, or really actually destroys what a concept is in terms of a missing link, right? It really makes it seem like it's going to be next to impossible to see to really find a brain size that's intermediate between humans and apes, a locomotion pattern at the same time that is halfway between quadrupedalism and bipedalism, right? And teeth that are intermediate between apes and humans, right? We're never going to find a single specimen that checks off all three of these categories, right? 
what we could uh, find in essence, um, you know, or what we know by now in terms of all of our fossil finds of our ancient ancestors is what we can identify as these general patterns that have occurred over time, like the shift to bipedal locomotion, the um, increase in brain size, uh, as well as differences in dentition. So as an example here that we can use about um, with mosaic evolution is um, or kind of defining a missing link, you know, a lot of people try to say that the australopithecines are a missing link, but this really isn't the case with them because we know by now we have many specimens that are very well known, well studied. They have relatively small ape sized brains, which are not intermediate between humans and apes. Uh, they're fully bipedal, um, spending about 85 to 90 percent of their time um, on the ground. Um, and in essence, what this is really meaning is that um, uh, they're not halfway between quadrupedalism and, and bipedalism. They're fully bipedal, right? And their teeth exhibit post-canine megadontia, which is very different from apes and modern humans, right? This is unique to the genus of Australopithecines. And what this is really just saying is that the uh, molar teeth become very, very large in our Australopithecines as compared to our apes and our modern humans, right? So this can't be used as an example of a missing link, right? Because the missing link really is placing very strict um, kind of parameters on what its actual definition is. So if we start to move through our fossil record, looking at some of our specimens here, we have two species of the genus Artipithecus. We have um, Artipithecus cadaba, which dates to around 5.8 to 5.2 million years ago. And then we have Artipithecus ramidus, which is 4.5 to 4.3 million years ago. And the reason why these specimens are important is for two things. One, they show a start in the reduction of the canine complex, right? Yes, you can see the canine is still a little robust here, but it's becoming more reduced compared to that of other um, primates. It's relatively in line with the rest of the teeth, right? Uh, another important thing that we uh, use Artipithecus for is because uh, in terms of the pelvis morphology, it is the uh, specimen that's really starting that transition to bipedal locomotion. So if we look at Artipithecus cadaba, which is um, a little bit older than um, our Artipithecus um, that we call Arty, right? Uh, he, some people have kind of criticized and said that the teeth are very, very ape-like and have some of the remnants of that canine cutting complex because they are a little bit larger and you can see some of the wear patterns on it. So the question really is, is, is Artipithecus cadaba and even a hominid, right, or a hominid? Well, if you look at the researcher, uh, Johannes Holly Selassie from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History um, would say that yes, it is indeed, because if you look at the canine compared with the rest of the teeth, the canine tooth doesn't really stick that far out from the rest of the tooth row. So what we're seeing here is a generalized reduction, even though it still has some of those primitive remnants of that canine cutting complex left. All right, so this is a map of Africa just showing you where some of the major finds have been um, have been done. We have Egyptopithecus here, which is uh, essentially a Miocene ape fossil, so we can just kind of cross that off a little bit. Uh, we also have Proconsul here, which is essentially a Miocene ape fossil, right? But in terms of the ones we've really talked about, your C. helanthropus chadensis, right, uh, found in kind of the country of Chad, which is very unique, right? See how far um, this specimen is from kind of the rest of the kind of zone where we find a lot of our specimens. Uh, our, Afrens, uh, our Africanus and stuff was found kind of down in the cave systems in South Africa there. Um, but we also have our Artipithecus ramidus, right? Uh, Kadaba and ramidus found here in the East Africa region, as well as our Kenyanthropus platyops, which um, we basically call all an offshore will put the same because we are lumpers here. We are not splitters. So in terms of uh, Artie's post crania, some people have said that, well, maybe Artie is more similar to a chimpanzee, um, stating, well, maybe uh, it has, yes, kind of bipedal locomotion features, but maybe it was a knuckle walker along with um, a lot of the other fossil apes being found at the time. But it shows that um, Artie's wrist was uh, quite flexible like an ape, and Artie had longer phalangeal bones like an ape, but Artie was not a knuckle walker. It lacks that ridge 
um, that bony ridge that's required on these kind of joints in order to lock them into place for a knuckle walker to kind of um, locomote without damaging their um, phalangeal bones. So if we look at some of Artie's other features, we have reduced canines. There's still a fair degree of facial prognathism or the amount of uh, that the face sticks away from the rest of the skull. There's a mix of bipedal and arboreal adaptations in terms of the pelvis, right? The, it has a bowl-shaped pelvis, but the iliums are a little bit longer. It has thinner enamel, which is very, very similar to that of an ape rather than that of other australopithecines or later australopithecines. So if we look at more of Artie's features that were a mosaic, we have uh, Artie's big toe is opposable, much like an ape, but the cuboid bone in the foot is much uh, human-like, right, which lends to a more kind of longitudinal, a little more stiff uh, foot arch rather than that of an ape. So the prior slide and this slide here are showing a comparison between Australopithecus afarensis um, pelvis as well as Artipithecus um, ramidus pelvis. And you can see that they both have a wraparound appearance, right, which allows for a good orientation of anterior gluteal muscles. Um, this aids in balancing the pelvis when all the weight is placed on one foot, right? So we're using this as essentially evidence that's kind of bull shaping that this creature was distinctly a biped. So this is just kind of further illuminating our lumping versus splitting debate. So depending on um, kind of where you sit on your taxonomy is really going to change how you feel our evolutionary tree kind of is constructed here, right? We all kind of generally agree that we move from some Artipithecus to uh, an Australopithecine, uh, mostly afarensis, but where it goes from there is where a lot of the argument kind of comes into play here. Do we move on into all of these different lineages starting um, you know, moving to like an uh, Australopithecus aethiopicus, like we see all the way on the left here, and out of that comes the genus Homo, um, or out of uh, Australopithecus africanus, does the genus Homo pop out, right? There's a whole lot of different um, kind of constructions that people have used to reconstruct the our evolutionary tree. We're just not 100% sure which one is correct, right, because we don't really have the DNA evidence to go off of. So if we look at a summary of our Artipithecus here, um, Artipithecus was experimenting with cautious bipedality, right? So he's a part-time biped, part-time quadruped. Uh, bipedality evolved in a woodland habitat, not in a savanna, right? Based on uh, environmental reconstruction, we know that there was wood, tree seeds, and woodland animals um, found in the area, right? So we know that uh, Arti evolved, or Artipithecus has evolved in a woodland habitat, not a savanna. So it was not like the trees were disappearing and that's what forced them to walk on two legs. So if we move on to our genus Australopithecine or Australopithecus, um, there are multiple species that exist. We already talked a little bit about our Australopithecus africanus, but we also have Afarensis, Anamensis, and Garhi. Um, and this is, these are just kind of the um, normal uh, Australopithecines, or what we refer to as the gracile or um, kind of thin skeleton. Uh, Australopithecines, right? We also have a whole other category of robust Australopithecines that have very um, robust features or kind of exaggerated large features. Um, these are Australopithecus robustus, Boisei. Um, some have actually classified Garhi in here as well, um, as well as uh, Sadaiba, right? And our Australopithecines in general display a mix of ape and human features. They have bipedal lower extremities, um, but are very ape-like in the face, right? And these ones essentially are almost fully, um, roughly 90 to 95% bipedal at this point. So our oldest species of Australopithecine is our Anamensis, which dates to around 4.2 million years ago. It's a possible descendant of Artipithecus. Uh, had larger canines and curved finger and foot bones, but was also the start of this unique dental characteristic called megadontia, right? And this is something that we see in these Australopithecines, but we don't see it in the Artipithecus. We don't see it in later species of Homo, right? So this is why we say it's really kind of hard to link some of these um, genuses together, right? Is this a possible descendant of Artipithecus? We're not sure, right? Because these teeth kind of throw a wrench in the whole um, evolutionary schema. 
So our Anamensis was found in East Africa near Lake Turkana. Um, some specimens are as old as 4.2, but we think the range is 4.2 to 3.9 million years ago. We know they're bi bipedal based on the anatomy of the tibia, another great example of mosaic evolution as they had a hominid-like lower body, but features of the face and jaw are strongly ape-like. Um, the ape-like features include parallel tooth rows or a U-shaped dental arcade, a mandibular symphysis that strongly slopes backwards, right, showing that the orientation of the temporalis muscle is a little more front to back rather than up and down. Uh, the upper canines uh, have enormous roots, right, so there's very large upper canines, and had a relatively small brain case, actually, as a matter of fact, less than that of a modern chimpanzee. A little bit later in time, we have another Australopithecine, um, which we're all a little more familiar with. This is our Australopithecine or Australopithecus afarensis, our little Lucy, right? Dates to around 3.6 to 3.0 million years ago, right? Found in that Afar region in East, uh, Eastern Ethiopia. Um, it had a non-opposable big toe, so it um, uh, essentially um, had a very, very human-like foot, right? Um, and had a very ape-like um, hyoid bone, which means no speech yet, right? So as far as we know, that up to 3.6 million years ago, we still don't have speech. Um, something that you're going to look at uh, in one of your lab activities here that you can see here is the Laetoli footprints. And what's important about these Laetoli footprints, and you can see it more clearly kind of here, is that what we're seeing is two distinct sizes, right? So we're seeing not only an adult, but also a juvenile walking alongside. And you notice that kind of all of the toes seem to be in line with one another, right? So this is much more of a human footprint um, than any of our kind of uh, prior Artipithecuses or um, earlier Australopithecines. So if we look at our Australopithecus afarensis, our little Lucy here, it's a 40% complete skeleton. Um, she was probably around three and a half feet tall. Males of this species were nearly five feet tall. Fully committed to bipedalism, right? We see this in a cross section of the um, femoral neck, seeing all that additional bone buildup, and the morphology of the pelvis, knee, foot, and ankle. All of these uh, features indicate bipedality, right? She still had slightly longer arms and longer fingers, which were a carryover from a more ape-like ancestor, right? So by the time we get to our Australopithecus afarensis, right, we're, we're dealing with fully bipedal um, creatures. So our afarensis itself is a very well-known, well-studied um, species, and findings have essentially been a very extensively published. Um, we have specimens that are as old as 4.2 and as young as 2.5 million years ago from several sites in East Africa. They're a great example of mosaic evolution because the species was essentially fully bipedal, there's no doubt in that, had a very small ape-sized brain, and had very weird teeth, right, that post-canine megadontia that was definitely not intermediate between humans and Ape, right? So what we're seeing is kind of these differences in the rates of evolution in these different systems, right? So Lucy and many other uh, afarensis individuals are from Hadar, Ethiopia, right? We've also found them in uh, Laetoli in Tanzania, more than a thousand miles south of Hadar, and at several locales in between, right? So this is showing you these creatures had a very wide range in terms of their kind of home range, right? They traveled quite a bit. At Laetoli, you see a trail of footprints, right? Two bipedal afarensis individuals walking side by side, right? And they both had the hallmarks of bipedality on those footprints, right? Big toe in line with the other toes, as well as the presence of a longitudinal stiff arch on the foot. So if we look at a close-up of the Laetoli footprint here, you can see there's a nice stiff foot arch here. Right, as well as all of the toes here are in line with one another. Right, yeah, you see a little bit of kind of the big toe sticking off here, but this wouldn't be considered opposable because generally, if it was opposable, we would see the toe sticking off of the side of the foot. Right, so this is definitely a stiff foot arch as well as a stiff uh, big toe. Right, and all those toes are in line. So this is clearly the set of footprints of a biped. So this is just showing you some of the uh, sites that we're really going to be looking at as we move on throughout these kind of recorded lectures. We're going to be looking at that lower valley of the Awash region, the lower valley of the Omo, 
uh, region as well. These are big areas of ancient human origins as well as the um, uh, volcanic crater a little bit further south. And then we're also going to look at some of the cave systems at Sterkfontein and Enverans um, and some of the other kind of uh, cave system finds in South Africa. So if we look at um, becoming human in terms of our anatomical change, right, um, know that uh, we had the movement of those iliac blades in the pelvis. They shortened and moved more laterally. The stiffened foot arch and a loss of an opposable big toe over time. The angle of the femoral neck is greater than 90 degrees, right, that bicondylar angle. And we have the elongation of the legs relative to the arms, right? These are going to be the general patterns of the general changes that we're going to start to see in a lot of these creatures, starting with our kind of afferensis or our fully bipedal creature, already having our stiffened foot arch, right? But as we move through time, we're going to see the, primarily this kind of elongation of the legs relative to the arms. If we look at the anatomical changes in the skull that have occurred up until we get to kind of our interesting little australopithecines, right? We have reduced canines over time. We have a loss of mandibular symphysis. The mandible itself becomes smaller. We have a steadily increasing brain size, starting with Homo habilis, um, and we'll talk about that later on. We have an increase in dental enamel, right? We have an increase in tooth size followed by a reduction. That's if we're saying that these osteopithecines are actually members of our evolutionary lineage, right? Remember, teeth are under very tight genetic control, so that really does throw a wrench into asserting that any of those australopithecines are actual direct ancestors, right? That would require a huge degree of genetic change in order for those teeth size to go from being really large in our early australopithecines, and then all of a sudden when we get to the genus Homo, the teeth go back down to the size that we see kind of in our early artipithecuses. So this is just showing you what we mean when we say that we had an elongated and kind of um, bent or curved finger bones, right? If we look at a gorilla here, right, of course, there's our very curved, right? They're a, a quadruped. If we look at our Australopithecus, um, our afarensis, as well as others, there's still that slight curvature, right? It's still a vested holdover, but it's actually much more similar to our modern human than it is our um, gorilla here. So we also have distinct um, changes that occur in the scapula, or otherwise known as your kind of shoulder blade, right? If we look at um, kind of moving through from afarensis here all the way through some of our apes to our modern humans, right? You can see that our afarensis had shoulder joints that were kind of similar to um, some of our apes. But if you look at um, our kind of modern human, right, when we're fully, fully bipedal and we have longer legs and arms, right, we start to see that the orientation of the uh, glenoid fossa is much more uh, lateral or to the side, right? So um, really what this really means is that this kind of orientation of the scapula and our afarensis is really just a um, kind of evolutionary vestige or holdover um, of kind of an earlier ape um, pass. So if we look at something that acts as kind of a uh, behavioral support for Lovejoy's provisioning hypothesis, you know, when the foot becomes fully bipedal, it can no longer function as a grasping organ, right? So essentially babies can no longer cling to their mothers with all four appendages, which essentially means that babies must be carried, right? Because babies cannot, with their uh, upper arms, not support their whole weight yet. So it's kind of interesting in saying that, well, all right, as we shifted to bipedal locomotion, the children lost the ability to grasp their mother's kind of body hair with all four things. So the uh, mothers had to start carrying the babies around, right? Um, so this may actually, in fact, say that, um, you know, this is why that provisioning behavior by males started, right? Because the females were kind of occupied carrying um, the young, right? But this is all at this point kind of just behavioral speculation. We also have something interesting that was found relatively recently called the Bertel foot, right? It's a partial foot from Ethiopia that was just 30 miles from where um, Lucy was found, but it's probably not the same species as Lucy, but alive at the same time. Um, Holly Selassie at the Cleveland Museum thinks it might be a continuation of the Artipithecus ramidus line. We're just not really sure at this point, right? We're still waiting to see um, kind of some of the comparative anatomy studies come out um, with this Bertel footprint. Another one of our australopithecines that we have is our Australopithecus garhi. This species may be 
a direct ancestor to humans, dates to around 2.5 million years ago, found at a site called Bori in Ethiopia. And it's the first osteopathist I've seen, at least according to the researchers, to have longer legs than arms, right? So it's definitely uh, pushing in the kind of good direction towards humans, right? And there's also an argument that osteopithecus garhi might in fact be our first tool maker, right? But that's not really what the consensus opinion at this point really is. So based on uh, Lee Berger and the people who found Australopithecus garhi, he says it's probably descended from Afarensis and adds a potential ancestor for the genus Homo. The remains are from a time when there are very few fossils between two to three million years ago, and it's found in the same layers with some very crude stone tools and what they claim are butchered animal bones. So um, what this is showing you kind of the new kind of proposition that um, you know, perhaps this Australopithecus garhi may say that um, uh, the creating this kind of new tool system called Lamequian may have been our first tool maker. But um, for our purposes here and for kind of the consensus opinion on the scientific community, we say that Oldowan tools are our oldest tool system, right? Because we just haven't found enough evidence here um, on the specimen to really say that it's distinctly a tool. This is showing you some uh, cut marks from a uh, long bone of a kind of extinct deer species that was um, living around the same time as our little Australopithecus afarensis. So what I want you guys to kind of glean from this is that whereas in the books and in kind of scientific literature, they'll say that all the one tools are the oldest tool system and that that's when we started using tools on mass. There's probably examples of tool use that go back much farther and tool systems that go back much farther. We just don't have enough evidence to really say definitively, yes, they could have been butchering animals, but were they doing it regularly? And was it really kind of the intellectual practice that we see in later in the um, genus Homo? We don't really know. So we also have something kind of interesting popping up. Um, later in time, some Homo species erectus, um, Homo erectus spread out um, from Africa and into Asia. Yet we find little to no stone tools from this time period in this area. And the question really is why? Well, if we look at research done by um, Dr. Metten Aaron at Kent State University, we have this uh, bamboo, to bamboo tool hypothesis. So it's likely that the earliest tools in Asia were made from bamboo rather than these kind of difficult to find chirts and flints or these other stone materials that were needed to make proper stone tools. So it's likely that a combination of both um, stone tools were produced, right? But we just don't have, you know, bamboo does not preserve, so we just don't have the evidence of the fossil record. So looking at some of our Australopithecines from South Africa, right, we've already looked at our Australopithecines from East Africa. Um, so looking, of course, we already talked a little bit about our Australopithecus africanus, our little Tong child here. Um, it's the first Australopithecine that was found, named the Tong child by Raymond Dart. It's a juvenile specimen and a larger hominin brain case, right? Remember, this one had a larger brain case than most of the other Australopithecines that were contemporaneous. So our Africanuses themselves are a very well-known species. We have a lot of specimens. So here's one specimen from Sturkfontein, STS-14. It's an Africanus partial skeleton. And of course, as you can see with the kind of flared out pelvic blades here, the shortened um, ilium here, right, and the widened sacrum, right, these are all uh, hallmarks of bipedality. So this was definitely a bipedal creature, just like our little Lucy. This is a STS-5, an adult female from Sturkfontein. You'll actually have a lot of experience with this individual in your lab activities. She's otherwise known as Mrs. Plez. Um, so just, you know, be sure, we're really what we're looking at here in terms of this is um, we still have a fair degree of facial prognathism or the amount that it sticks away from the rest of the skull here. Um, but you're starting to see that the brain case is a little bit larger, right? You're starting to see a little bit of an elongation in the back here. Um, and you're starting to see a little bit of a reduction in terms of um, the chewing apparatus, right? We don't have a sagittal crest on this creature, so in essence, you know, we're starting to see a reduction in those chewing muscles over time. So the pelvis uh, from Sturkfontein looks a lot like Lucy's. The limb bones look uh, bipedal as well. The brain size was similar to that of Afarensis, but the dentition itself is less primitive. 
than Afarensis. Um, it's a little more towards the genus Homo. And if your textbook or the new edition still has this, um, it's probably wrong about Africanus having a grasping big toe. Um, we don't have the fossil evidence, but if it's similar to that of other um, Africanus specimens that were found uh, and other Af uh, Australopithecines, um, didn't really have a grasping big toe. So if we look at teeth uh, in terms of our Australopithecines and kind of these earlier lineages, um, we look at primitive versus derived traits that we see. The canine cutting complex, including that diastema, the sectorial lower pre first premolar, um, these are all primitive traits, right? The large upper canine shears against, this is, we've talked about this before in terms of the behavioral tooth, the thin enamel African forms, right? And the, uh, kind of complex puts an edge on these kind of uh, cusps on the upper teeth, right? So in essence, these are your primitive features that we see, but the derived features that we see that are distinctly different, and this is kind of why we're getting at this as a, as a point here, is that a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, I didn't evolve from an ape. Well, you're right. Um, we diverged from apes quite some time ago and quite a long time before we even got to kind of the genus that may have even led to the genus Homo, right? So there's a lot of derived traits. There's a lot of evolution that occurred um, in that time period, right? In terms of our evolution, we have the loss of that canine cutting complex, right? We have the canine wears on the uh, tip of the tooth rather than on the sides. And we have much thicker enamel that starts to occur in African forms. So if we look at another discovery by Lee Berger here, we have Australopithecus sediba, dates to around 2.0 to 1.5 million years ago. It was discovered by the son of the anthropologist Lee Berger. And there's really a current debate over how to classify these specimens, right? Um, really the issue is, is um, they're trying to make the claim that this is the direct ancestor to, or direct, you know, uh, uh, line to the genus Homo. But, you know, our other arguments have been made that by 2 million years ago, Homo erectus is already around, already on the scene, already moving about. So the, this couldn't possibly have led to the genus Homo, right? Because the genus Homo by 2 million years ago was already there. So this is probably just a, a, a unique kind of offshoot of other Australopithecines. So in terms of overall morphology, if we look at it, right, our kind of sedibas are much more similar in morphology to that of our Lucy, right? They're just a little bit taller on average than our little Lucy's are, right? So what we're seeing is the kind of um, that range of variation, right? That range of environmental variation, right? That kind of caused these specimens to grow just slightly taller, but morphologically, they're pretty much the same as our little Lucy there. So really, should we be classifying these as two new species? I don't think so. We should strike this, call them all Australopithecine afarensis, and call it a day. So we know that it cannot possibly be the descendant or the kind of ancestor to Homo, um, because Homo erectus and Homo uh, habilis were already on the scene by 2.5 million years ago, so the genus was already well established. But most will agree that it is likely descended from Australopithecus africanus. So, so far, all the Australopithecines that we've talked about so far have been uh, what we classify as gracile. Their molar and premolar teeth were not especially huge, although some of uh, Garhi and Africanus back teeth were fairly large. Now, let's talk about some of our, um, what we call our robust Australopithecines. So these robust Australopithecines are kind of an odd spinoff of the genus, right? All are bipedal, but have a little bit smaller brains. So they're not taller or bigger brain than the gracile species. As a matter of fact, the gracile species are slightly larger brained, um, but robust in their massive chewing apparatus, right? So they were first discovered in South Africa with our Australopithecus robustus, but also later found in East Africa as well. The East African find by Mary Leakey at Olivia Gorge is particularly interesting and we'll take a look at all of these um, specimens. So our Australopithecus boisei, which dates to around 1.75 uh, million years ago, has wide flaring zygomatic arches, which is a fancy word for your cheekbones, um, and a huge uh, sagittal crest, right? So here we see the sagittal crest at the top and the wide flaring 
zygomatic arches, right? And those zygomatic arches are necessary as well as that sagittal crest for anchoring a temporalis muscle. So if you think about it this way, the tip of the temporalis muscle must have occurred right here, right? And went all the way down to here. So what we're looking at is this huge, thick muscular chewing apparatus used for crunching down very hard fibrous materials, right? And the individual we're looking at here is a uh, young adult male. So our robust traits in general, right, the molar and premolar teeth of the robustus are all very huge. The incisors and canines, or the front teeth, are very small and peg light, right? So these robusts are very derived in terms of their uh, evolutionary traits, right? They're specialized for chewing hard, tough, and fibrous vegetable foods, right? They're enormous zygomatic arches, anchored giant mass center muscles, which are the ones responsible for moving your jaw up and down. Uh, several species of robust were all living at the same time that humans were also on the scene living alongside them, right? So this is kind of an important point. I want you guys to kind of uh, think about this for a moment. Uh, there is significant overlap between a lot of evolutionary species, right? So it's not like it's a smooth, you know, well, this species happened, then died, and then came this one. No, there's significant overlap between the time periods for all of these species. So if we look at some of our robust australopithecines, we have Aethiopicus, which is the earliest of the robust uh, examples, um, and it's also a great example of mosaic evolution, has a mixture of robust features, very derived, and some that are seen in Australopithecus afarensis, right, which is very primitive. Uh, we also have Australopithecus robustus, which is from South Africa, Australopithecus um, boisei. Uh, comes from East Africa and, and is the most derived of all of them. But what's most important is all of those these robust Australopithecines by one million years ago were extinct. So this is showing you our Australopithecus aethiopicus, otherwise known as the black skull, dates from 2.3 to uh, 2.7 million years ago. You can see on the black skull, right, the wide kind of flaring zygomatic um, arches here, as well as the very large, robust um, sagittal crest, right? And this is all designed for anchoring these large kind of um, chewing muscles, right? Here's an example of an Australopithecus robustus, um, dates around 2 to 1.3 million years ago is their general time range, right? And as you can see, same general morphology, really wide, flaring zygomatic arches, but the sagittal crest on these specimens is not as exaggerated on um, some of our other uh, Australopithecines. So what makes uh, our Australopithecus boisei kind of the most unique or the most derived here is kind of the sheer size of the uh, mandible here, right? They have the sagittal crest as well that we see in our other robust specimens. They have huge, wide, flaring zygomatic arches, but it's really this huge mandible that um, really has about, uh, let's say, about this much more bone than we see in many of the other um, specimens, right? So it's extremely derived in terms of its mandibular morphology. So in essence, this is what we're going to be looking at here from this point on. So we have our Artipithecus ramidus starting at, at the earliest here, moving to our Anamensis, our earliest Australopithecine, then moving to our Afarensis. But where we go from there, um, did we evolve directly from Afarensis into Homo habilis? That's one potential. Did we evolve from Australopithecus garhi into Homo habilis, right? Him being our kind of earliest toolmaker, moving into our kind of earliest recognized toolmaker. Um, or was there any of these other ones, right? Look at the kind of shape and morphology of the brain case of our Australopithecus Afri africanus, right? That seems to be much more similar to what we see in the genus Homo here, right? A little bit taller, a little bit longer. So we just really don't know. This whole area here is a big kind of question mark, right? <laughs> 